Hello, this is Bryce LaFleur with the Tennis Journal Podcast here with former collegiate tennis player at Spring Hill College, Fergus O'Work. Right now, he's working towards uh, the beginning rungs of professional tennis. And uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming on this podcast, Fergus. Um, we've, we've had a really incredible relationship over the years. So I'm really, really happy I could have the opportunity to speak with you and get your perspectives, especially in this time that I'm in right now here in London, visiting Wimbledon. So, um, yeah, first of all, uh, could you just tell us about yourself and how you got into tennis? Yeah, thanks, Bryce. Thanks for having me. And, um, yeah, I hope I can do your podcast justice. But how I got into tennis was very simple. It was... Um, it's it's like religion or school. You you don't choose which way you go when you're when you're four years old. Um, and it's something that maybe you might take on yourself when you're older, right? In a more serious way. But I was four years old and I was brought down to the local tennis club. It's called Monkstown Lawn mm. Tennis Club, and it's a very family oriented club. And it's also a club that has a history of producing. Uh, or at least beginning the journeys of very high-level tennis players uh, who would be very well-known in Ireland. So it's actually the oldest club in Ireland as well. So mm. high performance, so so called, let's say, was never a massive emphasis at in that club environment, but it was a really happy place for me to be when I was growing up, you know? So that's that was my start in tennis. And then from the age of you know, four or five until um, the age of 18, really, I was playing a few times a week, but I never, in my uh, teenage years or, or childhood, I never decided, okay, I'm going to really seriously play tennis. And and that happened later. So mm-hmm. I went to, um, I went to college in America at a, at a team where I wasn't good enough to make the team. It's called Lander University. I did two years there, but I barely played any matches. And, uh, I wasn't that interested in trying to get onto the team at the time because I just didn't think mm. I could make it, you know? So uh, because of that and a few other reasons, I transferred to a lower level team uh, at Spring Hill. That's where we met, obviously. While at Spring Hill, um, it was the COVID summer. This was the, a big turning point in my tennis. Uh, I still have a long way to go, obviously, but I, I really stepped it up in, in the fall, winter of... 2020 and mm-hmm. it was a time it was the the height or the the depths of the covid period and i started i all i had at the time there was a month before school went back um mm-hmm. so, so the month of like a lot of july and the start of august i was in mobile with really nothing to do mobile alabama and i remembered a boss who told me about this guy called steve smith and mm-hmm. Smith has produced a huge amount of tennis content, which you're familiar with. And so I started looking at Steve's videos. And then from there, I really enjoyed the way Steve presented everything and the way he, uh, just the, the energy I got from him or whatever, the vibe that he uh, gives off in, on the podcast mm-hmm. as well. I really enjoyed his values and everything. Um, Apart from the information itself, it was more his personality that I was drawn to. And so I thought, I really want to go and spend some time at his place. And then I spent three months nonstop um, on a property where there were two courts. That was in Orlando, Florida. And that was with Steve Smith and Annie Fitzell and Andy's wife, Leo, a German woman, and a, a lot of kids. Um, so that's kind of, that's how tennis got more serious. And I'll quickly just summarize and say, I graduated from college just over a year ago and mm-hmm. I went to work with Tennis Memphis. Um, maybe we can come back to this later, but I was told that I should get shoulder surgery a year ago and I didn't really think I could play serious tennis without doing that. I ended up just procrastinating the surgery and kind of trying to manage without getting it. And um, for the last while, I've been playing pretty much every day and, and the shoulder hasn't been too much of a problem. And we can maybe talk about the, the nuances there later on. But I did six months in Memphis with a nonprofit organization called Tennis Memphis, uh, where we taught tennis to inner city youth. But also, I mean, people who 
uh, might have been more wealthy as well. You know, anyone, regardless of their ability to pay, that was six months. And then I decided I wanted to play full time, basically. And so I drove out to Northern California uh, to a small tennis academy there where I worked part time and trained every day. So I'm back in Ireland now competing and I've played in the last two months, probably over 20 matches. So anyway, that's that's kind of uh, that's my tennis history to date. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. So um, what, you know, what was like kind of your spark as far as like when did when you decided to take tennis seriously? It was really, it was Steve Smith's, that experience. Um, I think tennis is very frustrating for a lot of people. And the main frustration, mm -hmm. the main frustration is when you don't know what you need to do to get better. You're losing <laughs> or you're, you're beating certain people and you mightn't even know why. And then you're losing to certain people and you mightn't know why. And it's very frustrating. You feel like you're stuck at a certain level. And it's like, well, what do I need to do here, you know? And some people, it just looks like they have effortless power and they they just look really good. And you're like, well, how do I get like that? And what happened with Steve was I was really, your game is just broken down uh, stroke by stroke in slow motion. And it's kind of revealed to you the certain inefficiencies in your strokes. So from then on, I was kind of on a mission to to change my game or whatever. And even though my actual level, like if you just look at the, I don't know, the results or whatever, my level since gone there, I've in just in terms of results, isn't that much higher than it was back then. But I know, like I've made a lot of changes and I know a lot of the stuff that I need to work on. You know, so for me, I feel like I'm improving. And that's kind of what makes tennis more more enjoyable than before, where I was just kind of hustling and like making balls back, you know, without really having an intention of what I was doing or, or how to do it, you know? So that was, that was a big turning point. And then more recently I've met an Irish coach who anyone watching this should look him up. His name is Joseph O'Dwyer. He's done a podcast with uh, functional tennis. He's an Irish coach who has 20 years or thereabouts of experience coaching professional players. And he is extremely, um, extremely positive and extremely fun to be around and also extremely insightful. So that's been, that's been very helpful in Ireland and I plan to work with him indefinitely. So I'd say those two, those two people were massive, Steve um, and then Joe. So, so, um, you know, you did, you did talk about a little bit about this, um, but uh, I, I want you to go kind of more in depth with it, with, could you explain specifically your experience with Steve Smith and Great Base and like go into detail with what Steve Smith's taught you and his approach and his methodology and his philosophy just to, just to give insights for other people um, uh, yeah. how to approach their improvement? It'll be very hard to summarize it, but I'll, I'll give you one line that he says a lot and it's begin with the end in mind. So that's really what the great base is all about. It's you want to give people the best possible start in tennis so that they don't have to unlearn and relearn their strokes later on down the line. So I went there at the age of 22 and I've produced what they call or what's called myelin. Uh, and that's it's some chemical in your brain or something, which uh what would you say? It's it's like how habits are learned or something like that. So brain I have memory, a lot of yeah. brain memory and, and I, yeah. a lot of what, what you might call bad myelin in terms of uh, how I might have hit the ball or how I might move my feet or whatever, right? And it's harder for me to change than it is to teach the basics to uh, to a beginner. Now, that doesn't mean you can't change your game. But basically, the, the, the great base is all about the basics. And that's why it's called the great base. It's like if you start learning with this system uh it doesn't mean you'll become number one in the world but like you'll have a solid foundation in the game so that i would say more it's helped me as a player definitely but i would say more it helped me as a teacher uh, of tennis and that's one thing that the great base is all about it's teaching the players to teach and what's really cool about that is you have teenagers and even people younger than teenagers who have a life skill 
that they'll carry with them forever because you know you learn to communicate you learn to demonstrate uh, a visual demonstration you, i mean you just learn how to teach how to hit a ball you know so from that experience with steve and and learning the way the strokes are taught and learning the grips and all those kinds of things I felt far more confident teaching tennis thereafter. There's a, lo it's a long time before, this is one thing people might, um, it might be a reason people mightn't change their strokes. It's like, well, it'll take a while for you to feel confident hitting the ball if you're changing so drastically, right? But if you're teaching someone, especially if you're teaching a beginner, uh, I think you can't go wrong if, if you're looking at that information. How would you... I don't know how much detail you want me to go into, but I'll just quickly say it's about basics. Well, what basics? It's basically trying to simplify your swings and you're trying to be as efficient as you possibly can. And through research and through a huge amount of work that Steve has put in, um, mostly influenced by Vic Braden, as well as a few other really famous tennis coaches, they've kind of devised a system on, on what's the most efficient way to hit the ball, you know? And then, so what Steve did is he, he sees, well, here's the method to hit the ball. And then I've all these ways for how I can teach it. So they have all these things like hitting off the cone, uh, shadow swinging in the mirror, double hits, you know, letting the ball bounce twice before you hit to give you more time. Um, and then a huge part of it, I'll say, and then I'll shut up, but a huge part of it is where you have, um, a partner tossing to another partner, you know, because instead of having one coach and like six players, that's very inefficient, you know, or 12 players you'll see sometimes on a court. And it's just a joke, right? You can't really, you can't get very many reps if there's 12 people with one coach all using like that one coach's mm. feeding or whatever. You're hitting one in every 12 balls. But if you're with a partner, you just, you can divide the court up into, you could divide it into four courts or eight you know there's there's no limit to how you can adapt to a situation and and if you teach everyone uh the the, the drills it can be really effective on, on making tennis accessible to a, a massive scale and that's what i think mm -hmm. is really cool about it it's it's um you don't have to have like private coaching to get better you know you can do it in a group and everyone can teach each other so it's pretty revolutionary mm -hmm. in that sense and i think that's what you observed down in florida maybe you can talk with that or or maybe you don't want to right now um yes um i i really um one thing with steve is i that i do among many things is that um he, he tennis is in some ways a very elitist sport um i mean of course there's there's outliers and people from all types of backgrounds that, that have been incredibly successful you know you think of serena serena and venus williams and just many many others but um, a lot of a lot of Steve's values is um, accessibility, and um, he's put all of his you know education online for free. So um, that's one thing that I really really respect with Steve. And a lot of the things that he teaches are things that you can do alone, and it also you know helps you know open things up to where you don't necessarily need a private coach to do everything. And it's sort of just like a pay for play system, where you know you have to be able to afford. 70 to a hundred dollar an hour lessons just to learn how to play tennis. And, yeah. um, and also he's to demystified a lot of the myths, um, with, uh, teaching tennis, you know, me personally, like as a, as a tennis coach, I, I always thought I had like the passion to do it. Um, but like the education that I got from Steve helped me understand deeply what the strokes are and it's helped me be a, a much better coach. Um, but, um, I just want to see if I can go, and I, I, I can even talk about some of my own examples, but I want to see if you could talk about the, like maybe how Steve's methods helped you in your game, like specifically, or like okay. one, one thing that you were getting wrong that Steve helped you figure out. Uh, why don't we focus on the backhand ground stroke? Um, because on a, on a good day, that's probably my best shot. Um, the main thing and it seems some people just completely don't listen to this when you say it but I'll say I'll say it three times the grips 
the grips and the grips. Now, yeah. you don't have to have one grip to hit the ball, but there are certain grips where you'll have an easier time having a longer hitting zone than with other grips. And ideally, if you have a longer hitting zone, like you're going to be more likely to hit, make clean contact with the ball. And also, if you're uh, using your body and your hips and the kinetic chain in the, in the most efficient way, you're going to have a more reliable stroke. So the backhand for me really, um, I saw a massive difference. Beforehand, I had an open racket face. And so anyone who plays tennis, they'll know what that means. But if you, if you make contact with an open racket face, the ball is clearly going to go out. So that means you have to adjust your hand to close the racket face in real time when the ball is coming at you. And that's very difficult to do if the ball is coming very fast. Now, some people can do it. It doesn't mean you can't hit the ball with where you have an open racket face and then you close it. But ideally, your racket face will be closed and then you swing inside out or from close to away. And so that was kind of, um, that really resonated. The forehand, I struggled with a lot and I'm, I'm always kind of working on that. But I feel today, as it happened, I felt really good with it. Some days are better than others. Um, but I used to have an inverted racket head and that involves more adjustment, right? And then, but the great base method will, will encourage you to have, um, it's called racket on edge, or you, you just basically, let's just say, have the racket up high and then you can use gravity to let the racket go down and then the downswing will help uh, your racket speed coming up, right? Instead of you having to generate that all yourself. Um, so that's the forehand. The serve is, um, I feel like my serves improved an awful lot. It's just a lot simpler uh, with a low toss. If anyone wants to see um, really good serving, look at Roscoe Tanner. Uh, people mightn't have heard of him. Older people will will know who he is. But look up Roscoe Tanner, low toss. Nick Kyrgios, low toss. John Isner, low toss. Uh, Andy Roddick, low toss. A lot of these guys have, it look. People think like, oh, toss high for more time. Well, Steve will say that that's a myth. You have, you have more time to make a mistake if you toss higher. You know, that doesn't mean you can't have a good serve if you toss high. <laughs> but there's a disproportionate number of people who serve really, really fast when they have a lower toss. Um, you could just go on and on about it. Andy Fitzell would actually be a better person to ask about all this because he knows the information 40,000 times better than me. But those are some of the changes that I made. Also, the volleys. Um, in summary, you're trying to go strings to the target instead of chopping at the ball. Now, if you're trying at a really high level, if you're trying to um, if you're trying to hit like a short volley, and a lot of volleying at a higher level will be short angles, right? Or you're really close to the net and you're trying to hit it short so that the guy can't reach it. You mightn't go flat. You'll hit a bit of spin. But if you're teaching the basics to a beginner you have a better chance of teaching them to go like this than trying to like time it perfectly <laughs> with, with it, with a kind of a, you know, an open face and you're going down, right. There's more things to calculate. So yeah, I think, um, I, yeah, I, I need to know when to shut up, but, but that's a couple of the things that, that, I, that I've worked on. Mm, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, Steve, um, you know, helped me learn a lot of things too. Um, one a couple of things that stick out just briefly is um understanding true topspin and uh moving the racket in an upward motion uh and um also shortening shortening the backswing um that's that's helped me uh significantly increase my margin for error and also get a lot more depth in my shots um and also uh, as fergus said hitting the ball with a long hitting zone um, and not having limbs of a child, that's, it's, it's so simple, but it, I think maybe that could be the, one of the most important things for any tennis player hitting with a, a long, a long hitting zone. Um, uh, also letting the racket fall like a pendulum, um, and on the serve, um, you, you know, um, you know, with the sock, I think they would, you know, put the put balls into a sock and throw the sock. And, um, it actually kind of reminds me of a, a drill, a drill that, uh, um, 
Richard Williams used to do where they where they threw the rackets, but that's really similar because you throw this throw the sock, and really it's like the the service is very similar to throw a, a throwing motion. So um, I I actually do think I had a pretty good serve before, but um, what that yeah, understanding? It was, I remember it was your best shot by far. But yeah, yeah, go ahead. yeah. Yeah, it, it it that really helped the serve. Uh, even you know, I think I probably got five, ten more uh, miles per hour on the serve. Plus, it, but it's also just insanely more consistent, and um, and I don't, and it's a lot easier on my body. For instance, like my serve, a lot of times wore down my body because um, I would have, even though there was pace on the serve, I would have, I would be serving palm up, so um. Yeah, so I was able to figure out I'm serving palm up, and um, so many things. Um, I was like spinning out. So what really what you need to do is you need to, uh, you know, you know, have your body face the uh the right net post. Um, so that you, so many. I mean, I could I could probably talk for it. That could be like a hour video about what Steve's taught me, but I just mm -hmm. wanted to give some examples. But um, people will ask. You might see the videos and say, oh, well, what does that look like at a high level? I'll just chip in that if people want to see what the strokes, ideally, I think I've heard Andy Fitzell say that if you want to see the really clean strokes, look at Corda, look at his ground strokes. Yeah, he and has that great might, ground strokes. That might be what the finished product might look like. Now, I'm not saying Steve taught Corda, but that might be what it looks like. Or, or if you look at uh, Titsy Pass's ground strokes as well. And... Uh, Yes, yeah, I actually saw um, court. That, that's kind of how, yeah, that's how it looks like to the nth degree, let's say. And then mm -hmm. you can also look up Raven Klassen. Uh, I think he's a Grand Slam champion in doubles. Mm -hmm. And then you can look up Connor Smith, Steve's son. Mm -hmm. There's a few videos of him on YouTube. So you'll see people hitting off a cone and people will say, oh, well, how do you do that at a high level? You know, well, if you look at those players, that's kind of what the system is trying to get you to, to look like in, in the end, you know, so that's. And also Max uh -huh. Cressy's position. I remember seeing the rowdy position is a massive part of the great pace. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember I took a picture of Max Cressy's rowdy position and it looked pretty good. Uh, JJ Wolf's serve. Uh, I was just talking to someone about that today. JJ Wolf was coached mm, by Andy Fitzgerald. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, his forehand and backhand as well, but, but you'll really see the coiling with the serve and, and I mean, he's very explosive as an athlete anyway. You know, it's not like, I don't know, he, he's got some physical attributes that are great as well. And then last thing I'll say is, um, if anyone here knows who Matt Clore is, uh, C-L-O-E-R, he is a phenomenally, aesthetically appealing tennis player uh, and coach. He's a national coach, well, former national coach at the USTA. I think he's a college coach with Florida right now, Florida men's tennis. And he looks... He's the finished product of, of the great face. Let's let's say that. So if anyone gets the chance to see him play, um, that's kind of yeah. That that's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually saw Sebastian Corda Corda recently at uh, Queens, and um, I was just looking at him, and uh, he actually he was playing Carlos Alcaraz. He, he actually lost that match, but his strokes were all on point. And I actually wondered if he was he was taught by Steve because exactly kind of like what he's mm -hmm. teaching. It looks like you know that's what he Sebastian Corda is doing on court, and it's a really really amazing example of that. Yeah, I don't I don't think he was taught by Steve, but yeah, that's just to your to your point. It it, it looks really nice. So Steve says it's a funny thing. He he'll say who who's he who are you trying who do you want to win? And Steve will always favor the person with a better technique because mm -hmm. yeah, I heard say, I heard that yeah. <laughs> he'll say that's better for the game. Now, obviously, there's a there's more to tennis than technique. Um, so, so that's not the only thing that'll determine your success, but, but uh, it, it'll certainly help if you have better technique. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, no. And I, I hope we can get more into that as we go forward. Um, so um, I also want to, if, if you could maybe give some insights about um, things that Steve taught you, um, you know, mentally or as a person, um, like uh, what, like, could you explain Steve as like a mentor or like maybe some things that mm -hmm. you learned personally from Steve just about life yeah. or, or tennis I'll, or how that applies or whatever? Yeah, I'll, I'll tentatively say two words and that's tough love. Uh, so Steve, if you, 
I, I know, surprise you spent some time with Steve. Um, he will be very frank in his in his uh, feedback, <laughs> and sometimes it might be like hard to take in the moment, but it's always he has so wise and he's seen so many case studies that he'll know what you need to be told. And generally speaking, people are too nice to tell you or they don't care enough to tell you what you don't want to hear. And Steve doesn't care like about that. He'll he cares about what's what's right and what will make you a better person what will make you a better coach and what will make you a better let's say student of the game or steward of the game how can you best you know be in tennis and and so he'll he'll cut what do they say cut through the what was that expression cut to the chase cut through the what what am i trying to say i think cut to the chase yeah yeah cut the crap you know and and oh, okay. and so but but the funny thing about Steve is, uh, your first, um, you'll leave there and you'll think, "Geez, like, this guy hates me," <laughs> and and yeah, then you'll, <laughs> and then, and but then you'll talk to him after the fact, and he's he's always very patient and and always will try to help you in whatever way he can, you know. So that's just his method of of feedback and. Uh, and you, you can't, this is one thing he'll say is there is no positive, there is no negative. It just is. So you can't take it like, you can't be too sensitive. And I think that's life. I think in life, things will go wrong and you have to just try to be, I don't know, rational in your in your approach to responding to a, a difficult situation. And, you know, you, you just got to get, get the job done. So, so, so Steve kind of really, epitomizes work ethic and respect um but also kind of humility um that's a major thing of his is he doesn't just want to show off about like oh i've coached this you know us number one or this ncaa number one or whatever he, he'll he actually be just as interested in a beginner a complete and absolute beginner learning the basic strokes and he'll give them just as much time as he will a really high level division one college tennis player. That's, I think that's, that's, I think the, the, the way you could summarize Steve, a beginner player or an intermediate junior or whatever will come and Steve will spend hours and hours doing a video analysis with that person. And he would do the same. If Annie Murray walked in the door, he'd do the same process. He'd record all your strokes or with his assistants and, and with his students. He obviously doesn't do it all himself because uh, it's a lot of work, but he does the most of it, you know, and, and he just has helpers with him. So that's kind of the thing. It's respect for everyone, regardless of their level. And he has a line, don't be a tennis snob. So that's kind of how, how it summarizes his, his values. Um, yeah, it's it's hard to... It's hard to calculate the impact he's had on me, but it's certainly very, very substantial. And then I know there's hundreds, if not thousands, probably thousands of people like me who have really been touched by him. And then all the people that he's taught, they've taught hundreds of th or thousands of people, right? So uh, just the most kind of prominent example, not to go on and on and on, but the, the most prominent uh, coach in America that Steve trained is a guy called Dave Anderson. And... He's coached several hundred uh, college players in Brookhaven and Dallas. Um, and then he's, yeah, there's there's tons of other people who, who've had massive success as well. But yeah, I, that's it. He, he the first, I'll, I'll say this, my, my first time I saw him uh, in person was, um, it was at night. I arrived at the house late and Annie Fitzell was showing me the place. But then the next morning, it was dark before practice and I was walking out. I'll always like say hello to someone or whatever. <laughs> and he was wearing the headphones and he was on his morning walk. And he, he had an air of gravitas. Like it was like, okay, we're, we're, we're serious around here. And then practice started and it was like, there was no no messing around, you know, it, it's, um, so there's a kind of a reverence for the work 
and there's a reverence for the sport uh, and there's a reverence for just work, you know, that I think you will have to adopt if you spend enough time around there, you know? Yes. Um, Steve Smith also played a, a big impact with me too. Um, you know, growing up, I actually had a pretty uh, turbulent childhood. And although I loved tennis, I was never really able to get the coaching that I felt like I needed. Um, so actually, Steve Smith was my first tennis coach. And, um, you know, it was uh, the, when I first met Steve, he seemed kind of quiet and quite cold. And then like a lot of the stuff that he was telling me would just hit to the core. I mean, it would feel pretty bad, um, to be honest with you. But um, I really, over time, um, I and and after I had some perspective on the situation, I really started to see uh, that Steve did really have a lot of wisdom, and um, also like as like the longer that I have this the knowledge that Steve taught me, like the the higher dividends as it's paying. It's sort of like it's almost like a compounding interest investment, so to speak. You know, like um this understanding is helping me with my game and as all and as a tennis coach it's, it's really really helped me understand what it takes to be a good tennis coach and to help my, my players improve by giving them you know proper understanding of good techniques and um also just this experience with Steve helped me you know raise the caliber person that I am you know and was and you know what's expected in a in a in a you know winning environment and and I want and what Fergus said this reverence for work um I did don't get me wrong I, I did take coaching tennis very very seriously but I mean just the experience with Steve took it to a whole nother level and um I just like my professionalism my ap approach you know um has all vastly improved and I mean I I I had my time with Steve was relatively short but um, in that time, I think I really, really took a lot from the experience. And I, I'm also really appreciative that he was, you know, you know, able to work with me. And, um, you know, for a first coach, I, I think I couldn't have been luckier because also yeah. he teaches the, the basics. And also it's, I mean, this is like the top of the, you know, top of the line stuff that you would need um, in the beginning stages of, of your development as a player or a coach. So, um that's just my perspective on that. Um, so, yeah, Fergus, uh, the next question I'd like to dive into is, um, you know, what are your keys that you would focus on the most to improve as a tennis player? Say it again. What What are the keys to focus on? Yeah. What would you focus on to improve as a tennis player from somebody who's played high level tennis and also somebody who's been a tennis coach and also somebody who's worked with a guy like Steve Smith. Yeah, I, I want to, first of all, state my level of tennis. I don't want to overstate it. Uh, oh, no, it's okay. It's okay. But no, it, you know, okay. You're, you're a college tennis player. I know Steve wouldn't call you too good. But... I know, I know. <laughs> but for the record, just there's so many levels right to tennis. And like, uh, just to put it in perspective, like if I was to play a futures tournament and be in the main draw, I, I would be not winning a match right now so that's i just don't want people to think i'm some you know expert on professional tennis i'm not that um but um i think accepted by everybody is the fact that you need some athletic ability to play at a high level maybe we should just start at a lower level first though because you know if steve has a line we could keep going on on about steve but uh, someone would say to him, hi, I'm Tom. I'm a high-performance coach. And Steve would say, hi, I'm Steve. I'm a low-performance coach. <laughs> yeah. As if, you know, if people don't respect teaching beginners. And and you'll have these really high-level coaches. But then you say, well, how would that guy do if he had a beginner who, as Vic Braden would say, was going to put the ice cream in the middle of his forehead if he had an ice cream because he was that uncoordinated, you know? So... I don't know. I think we could all learn a lot if, if we if we taught every week a little bit to a complete beginner. Um, but anyway, regardless of your level, Bryce, I think athletic ability, and that doesn't mean God-given talent, but if you can't catch a ball and if you can't throw a ball, if you can't kick a ball, 
if you can't run, if you can't jump, if you can't lunge, if you can't do the karaoke step, if you can't do skipping, if you can't cycle, all those kinds of skills, you'll struggle as a tennis player because just watch a tennis player. They're moving, they're stopping, they're changing direction. And then they have a racket in their hand, which it's like they've got to do all this stuff with their hands as well. It's it's actually quite amazing that the number of things that are going on. So the less thinking you can do when you're just moving your body, I think that's huge. Um, so I'd say, yeah, that's that's kind of the hand eye coordination or whatever, however you develop that, I, I would suggest to anyone looking to improve their tennis well play basketball and play soccer and play baseball and play any sport with a ball and do any kind of gymnastics or even swimming to build up like your your upper body your shoulder strength and your stamina running like get fit (laughs) you know these are all things we can all work on um but like you'll you'll never see a high level tennis player who who couldn't also you know catch a ball that's you know, shot up into the air. All these skills are linked. So so that's kind of a, a massive thing. I'd say athletic skills <clears throat> that apply to every other sport. And then, or not every other sport, that apply to other sports and that come from other sports. Then I'd say, um, I'm not going to say anything new here, but but just repetitions of, like, you just need to feel how it feels to hit a ball. and And so, like, you just need to get out there. And, and that's something I, one of the reasons I'm excited to play more tennis, even though I'm 24, you know, some people might say, well, what's this guy doing trying to play like at a really high level and he hasn't made it. And he's already 24. Well, I'll say, well, actually I'd never really did that many reps before I was 22. So I'm like a 15 year old in some sense. Like I have a huge number of reps that I've yet to, to get under my belt. And, and I think, well, let's see if I do, x thousand more hours of just hitting balls how much better will i get you know like even if you don't have the best coaching if you're on court every single day you're going to get better you know you could be against a wall and you're going to get better because you're just getting those reps and brain memory people mistakenly call it muscle memory apparently that's not the right term but like you're going to learn so so getting a ton of reps and then another thing i'd say in people I think um, people don't talk about this enough. I think your training environment, Bryce, is massive. Uh, I've been in some really miserable training environments where I didn't want to be there. Uh, I didn't like the people who were there. (laughs) They didn't like me. Mm -hmm. I mightn't have liked the coach. I mightn't have felt like the coach cared. Uh, But it's costing money. (laughs) Like, this is a joke. (laughs) And like, this is a, a disgrace, you know, and and uh, so you, you will if you're your your whole body and your brain and your mind, it's all connected. So if you're feeling stimulated and if you're feeling like you're in a good place and you're around people that support you and that you feel like you should support or you could support, you're going to play better and you're going to improve faster, you know, so and and then you. I don't want to overstate the fun, fun, fun thing because then people might forget the learning, right? But I do think you have to make it an enjoyable environment for people to to be at their best. I think that just, there's no escaping that. I have a, I have a small anecdote from a close friend of mine, Philippe Corteau, and he's coaching uh, for the Canadian Federation. And he was watching, uh, I think it was Halep, practicing at the Rogers Cup. And he said what he noticed was how much fun she was having on the court. And the, the thing about it, he said, like, if you're traveling on the road, however many weeks, is it 40 weeks a year or 30 weeks, however many weeks a year these guys are on the road, it's a brutal lifestyle. So if you're not happy on the court, like you're you're screwed because you're spending so much time on the court. So that's what I'd say. Um, find a good environment. Mm. Uh, find coach find a coach that like is a good person uh, and doesn't just have a, a good ability to sell himself or herself find a coach who you think is like i don't know would this person be a good childminder 
and will this be someone who'd be good to drive my kids around or whatever you know will this be someone who I trust with my kids and someone to teach them the good values because at the end of the day the vast majority of people overwhelming majority of people are never going to make money playing tennis if you're if you're going into tennis at the start and you're trying to say oh I'm going to I don't know, I'm just chasing the money or whatever. You're, you're in the wrong profession, you know, so you're better off going in there saying, I, I want to try to, uh, I guess if you have a kid, if you have a child, I would say tennis should be a way for your, your child to become a better person and to learn the value of kind of independence and hard work and honesty and all those kinds of things, you know? So that's something I think is really important. And that's something <clears throat> that, my home club, Monkstown Lawn Tennis Club, that was huge there. You know, they'll celebrate the high achieving players like Connor Gannon. He plays at the University of Memphis. Um, he's one of the best players in Ireland right now. He won the national clothes tournament, like the it's called the Irish Clothes. He won that last week. But you know, what Connor would say about Monkstown is like it, it's a place where you're happy to be there and, and it's a place where Playing fair is, is is emphasized, and and like we had a rule. I remember with Stephen O'Shea, the club coach in Monkstown, he used to say, "You're not allowed to say the two words. Uh, you're not allowed to say unfair, and you're not allowed to say cheating." So, I think people might find that interesting. You know, mm. we were just not allowed to say those two words at 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 our training or whatever. You know, so mm. what did I say? The the athletic ability reps uh the environment and then i think as you as you get better and and try to if you if you want to play really seriously i think some people manage to get an atp point on their own but overall you're you're going to struggle on your own so if you somehow can find an environment where you have a coach that's going to just be really the only way you can maximize your potential and and i think any really high level player would say that i think any high level coach would say that um now the obvious problem with that is money so you've got to be creative and find ways well could you assist a coach could you help him out with the younger kids and then hit in with the older kids or something like that and when people see that you are really into it and that you're uh, you just want to get better and you're willing to help out they'll try and help you out you know i think that's one really cool thing about um I found that in America in particular people are extremely like some people just help you and you're like geez I don't deserve this you know and and people can be very generous so if you show them an interest and and that you're keen uh, and that you're willing to give back in some way I think people might help you even if you don't have the funds you know so you've got to be very persistent a lot of the time mm, yes it's is there anything I'm missing? I mean, it's but so, summarize it and you say tennis is a microcosm of life. It's like, well, what's the key to living a, a good life? Well, you could write 10 books about that. You know, no one can answer that question briefly. And you could say the same about tennis. There's no one thing about tennis. As Julian Bradley, my good friend, says, the secret is that there is no secret. There's no magic mm -hmm. pill. It's it's um, it's a life's work of... of mm -hmm. uh, of drudgery and uh sometimes sometimes you feel really good on the course but but that's that's if you're lucky yeah 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 no that's a an excellent uh um you know zero to 100 view about uh how to do this um i just want to add uh you know I, i'm i'm still trying to figure out um exactly my methodology it's something that i'm in the process of learning um i i do think that's a very very good point with uh, like uh, making, you know, your athletic, you're just pure athletic ability. Because I think, you know, especially in America, I think uh, a lot of coaches are just training tennis players and not athletes. Like one thing that I saw in Spain is that it would be more like, it seems like there's more of an athletic focus to players and there's a lot more focus on like fitness and movement and like, and maybe it's perhaps it's about, you know, how it's clay court tennis is a lot more physical than hard court tennis in general. So, you know, maybe it's just a little bit of that, but, you know, um, 
you're a good athlete, a lot of times you're going to be a good tennis player also. Um, you know, this is – Steve is big on this. I would, I would say that you need a really good technical base. But um, at the same time, I think your technical base will only take you so far because then it becomes about, like, how do you respond to different situations? Because literally, like, every single ball you hit in tennis is different. So, like, your technique will make – you're make it a lot easier, but I think really it's like how how do you improve hitting your hitting your hitting the ball in different situations? Like how do you improve your situational awareness, your decision making, your strategy, and your emotional intelligence? And um, that's all gonna really help you improve. So in summation, I would probably say like a good physical and athletic base, a good technical base, and then sort of just the ability to improvise to make things happen to be creative on court and i think those are all kind of the things that um lead to improving your 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 game how could you do that um one have a deep understanding about tennis like the physics of tennis um you know steve smith great great example of that um do shadow swings do a lot of creative visualization um you know uh also do drills that make you do different things on court like uh one thing that i learned is um you know spin shots you know hitting the ball hitting 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 specific targets on the run um you know making different technical decisions that's all great things that i think will help you improve at a high level so um yeah um uh but you know fergus i i actually like to uh go more into like um so, for instance, could you give some insights about, and you did talk about this, I appreciate it, but could you go a little bit deeper in, like, um, let's say you're, like, a player, you maybe just graduated college, or, you know, you're a player and you're not, like, from, coming from, like, some super rich family. How Can you tell us, like, some creative ways that you can kind of figure out the game to, you know, s still improve or still be around tennis, let's say, mm. in, in a non-traditional sense? Because, like, you are a great example of that, man. Like, I mean, tennis Memphis was great. Um, you know, could you, could you like tell us some things like how you could creatively, you know, figure out how to stay in tennis? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. I think a lot of people, they, if, if they don't play college tennis, right. And they were a serious junior, then they stop at 18. Then they play in college and they're 22 and but then they've graduated and they're done i th i think a lot of people burn out they've just had enough and tennis just beats you down uh competitively anyway sometimes yeah. the losses and the, the the it's not so much the physical demands i think it's more the emotional demands that really weigh a huge amount on, on people and so that's a struggle um and I don't know. Everyone's, yeah. I mean, there'll be several times when you're playing and, and you're thinking, geez, do I really want to get up and do this again tomorrow? And, mm -hmm. and so that's just, that's unavoidable with tennis. How can you make it work? First of all, you have to say, well, do I want to make it work? And I, I, I don't think like for a lot of people, it's not the thing to do. I, for me, it's like, well, I thought I, I'm, I'm pretty fast and I thought like, screw it. I, I, I want to know how good I could have been. And, and so I was like, I'm only young once. That's what Steve used to say to me. He's like, you're only young once. And if you want to go play, go play. So I can't decide to do this when I'm 44. It's like, well, let's, let's do it now. I'd say that the most uh, concrete thing I did, I, I can only speak from experience. And, and, and the, the most concrete thing I did was I, I drove across the country. I already, mentioned that and I, I spent a few months at a small academy where I worked part-time and then I was training with the kids that's really I think a, a pretty standard way to do it if you don't have the money is you'll go and and you'll help out somewhere and then they'll let you train for free I, I don't know look it up you, I, I think I, I think that that if I could give any suggestion it would just be like ask 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 and, and be persistent like send an email to a tennis academy that you've heard of or 
ask your friend who did it or whatever, you know, and, and ask people who know who've already done it. I've like I mentioned earlier, close friend Julian Bradley, he played on the tour for a few years and uh did fairly well, all things considered. He started tennis pretty late. And he's been a huge kind of a big brother figure for me who, who I've asked about pretty much every decision I've made in tennis. I've kind of I'll bounce off an idea, you know, I'll bounce it off him. So so I'd say like find someone who who you think knows more than you know and, and has experienced it more than you have. And and without that, you're just gonna be urinating into the wind. <laughs> it's just like there's so many things that can go wrong. So ask someone who knows better. Uh and try to find an academy. And mm-hmm. and then another thing, like you, you might have to relocate. Like that's that's another unsociable thing about tennis. Like um I'm in Ireland right now and there's only a couple of months of the year where there's constant competition. And even that competition, if you wanted to play full, full time, you wouldn't be in Ireland. So you're going to have to travel it, unless you're living in uh, Florida or, you know, it's Southern Florida or some parts of California, but like, you're going to have to travel a lot. So I don't know, you're going to have to be um, adaptable to all of that, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah. know, does that answer the question? But, but that's, yeah, no, I, I think it does. Um, I want to add like, um, yeah, I mean, certainly I would like to train more. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, it is kind of, um, in in the Bible, I guess it says it says like ask and it will be given, and I think that's actually it's pretty simple. But like you'd be surprised what you can get just by asking the question and showing up. And um, you know, um, tennis, I think in a lot of ways is a kind of like an intimate experience. In that, um, like for instance, in Wimbledon, I am literally like right next to the player. I mean, they'll just be right next to me, and it's no big deal. I mean. It's, you know, it's not like maybe probably perhaps some bigger sports where it's like, you know, there's millions of people. It's like a small, close knit community in a lot of the ways. So, mm-hmm. like, you know, um, I have gotten amazing opportunities that I couldn't even imagine from tennis just by um, being around and, you know, asking for help and, uh, you know, just trying to put myself where I think, you know, the 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 environment is. So, um, you know, a lot of this, a lot of it is just having the belief and asking the question like um, and then I think uh, a lot of doors can be open that you may not expect to be opened. So um, I think that's very well said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, um, yeah, Fergus. Uh, and yeah, I mean, um, I think things didn't work out uh, how I even hope that I even hope. But um, I wasn't able to experience Tennis Memphis with you. Um, maybe maybe down the down the road it might be something that I'm open towards. But um, could you take us through your experience at Tennis Memphis, and um, could you give us insights you learned as a player transitioning to a coaching role, and how did that help you on the playing side, and also um, you know, how did that help you on the coaching side, you know, with your background playing college tennis and and uh, and you know, working with Steve and all that. Yeah, yeah. So Memphis, um. It was a, the way I'll say it is this, if, if there's, in, in any job, I, I don't know if I want to be a tennis coach when I'm older, right? Um, I'm, I'm in it more to play now and, and I love teaching tennis, but I don't know if I'll do it when I'm 50, right? But, but the way I did that job in Memphis, it's like if there's, if there's any tennis job I could enjoy and for it to feel meaningful, it would be at a place like Tennis Memphis because you do feel like um, even though you're getting paid, it's not like I'm some Mother Teresa, you know, volunteer, <laughs> but like mm-hmm. you still do feel like you're you're doing a good thing for people who really get something out of it. And it's just very cool that like a lot of the kids, they they just don't have the means to play tennis, but Tennis Memphis makes that possible. Now, Tennis Memphis is not unique in that regard. There are several organizations who do that, but it's it's one of the organizations who do that, you know, and, and that's just really cool. Um, I was very fortunate to be mentored, I would say, and, and um, uh, 
I t- I learned from a guy, a boss called Nick Lascaris. And the main thing that anyone would say about him is his, his constant enthusiasm. And he, he was never one to make excuses. And I can be a little more up and down. You know, I'm not always, uh, I don't know, do, doing the best job that I, <laughs> that I possibly can do. But he would never, ever, like, have a, a day where you're like, oh, Nick could have Nick could have done better today, you know. So, like, just to be around that was 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 a privilege, um, and just to, I mean, all the people that it it wouldn't really, I could name names or whatever, but but it doesn't mean anything to the people listening to this, you know. But I I just have some very fond memories of, of 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 my time there, especially working with the juniors. The thing about teaching children is that like as opposed to teaching adults it's that the potential for your impact is way greater than if you're teaching an adult now you can you can enhance an adult's life if you're giving them a tennis lesson of course but you can really form a young person and and you can get them healthy you know and you can maybe make them respect their schoolwork more in theory you know if they Tennis can kind of apply to other parts of life, and 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 you can really there there's a you're more f- open to formation, let's say, when you're younger. So I think that's why people enjoy working with young people, and that was my favorite part of of tennis math is certainly working with the kids. And um, yeah, in terms of the the coach and player dichotomy, I would say uh, playing. A, a huge thing for any coach to understand, Bryce, is I would say you need to, sorry, you, you need to know who you're talking to. And and if you're saying too much information at once, a lot of the time, especially in a one hour a week lesson, a lot of the time the person, it's too much and they'll actually get overwhelmed. So you can learn some empathy as a player and you're like, well, if someone has given me a lesson and they're telling me five things at once, I don't know what the hell to do and I'm and I'm anxious, you know. Or even the tone of voice that they use. You'll you'll recognize if you're a student, well, what's the kind of tone my coach uses and when I when I resonate more with that or whatever, you know, versus like, well, what doesn't work? So I, I've definitely taken since becoming a tennis I I since since starting teaching and coaching tennis, um and then when I go back to playing, I'm more curious about like the the tone, and 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 you can't just spit out this information and and that's enough, you know. I, I I'll put it this way, again to quote Steve, but teaching is information transfer, he says, and then coaching is a human relationship. So you know if you want to kind of more nuanced instruction and and like someone to walk with you, there's just a lot more to it than than spitting out information. Um, Sorry, last thing I'll say about tennis, Memphis, and this is something I learned from Nick, and he he used to say that the students will mirror the energy of the coach, and I think that's a great thing to think about. You know, you sometimes you're given a lesson, and you think, oh, like that person was being, uh, you know, not very nice today, <laughs> or you think like, oh, that group of kids, they were little, you know, they were being little rascals. But then if you really think about it, you're like, well, I probably wasn't as prepared for that for that lesson as I could have been. And maybe that my lack of preparation resulted in the other person being a little less interested. And, you know, you feed off each other. So really, it's it's a massive responsibility every time you're with a group to to bring it, you know, bring your A game or whatever. And that's not to say that I do that all the time, but absolutely that that's the best way to do it and um you can't just go through the motions you know that, that was the, the main thing i learned from nick uh at tennis memphis so yeah the, it, it was really a, it was a wonderful job and the, the only reason i left was i wanted to spend more time training and that kind of environment and the the city and just the infrastructure in terms of like training opportunities and stuff it, it was um there, there was a another option that I thought would would be better suited to what I wanted to do at the time, so that's why I left. But it was a wonderful experience, and I really enjoyed uh, the city as well, not just the the job. The other insight. So the next thing I'd like to dive into is 
what's your perspective of overcoming injury? You know, I know you had that shoulder injury and also you're having, um, you know, sort of a, a minor injury. We don't know what's going on now. So, um, you know, this is something that a lot of athletes have to come back from. And I think it's just a part of the game. So could you go into what it, you know, what's your perspective on overcoming an injury? I'll say two things to start off. Firstly, how do you avoid injury? Number one, you have a really good body and you're just fortunate, like genetically or whatever, right? But secondly, you prepare so that you don't get injured before you get injured. So a lot of the time we talk about injury after it happens. But any strength coach or any physio will tell you, well, you should be doing this stuff even if you're not injured so that you're prepared for the strain that the sport puts on your body. So that's kind of, I think, really important. And, and the sooner you can start working on your strength and conditioning, uh, the better. There's just no, there's nothing that can go wrong if, if you're doing that in a responsible way and with someone, you know, following someone who, who knows what they're doing. But in my mm. case, I, I, like a lot of people, would have been lazy and didn't want to do the, the gym work until I had to you know, and I was always naturally pretty fit in terms of aerobic ability, but always pretty skinny and not very strong. So, um, yeah, a year ago, a bit over a year ago, I had uh, just pain in my left arm, I'm left-handed, and I was told that I had a torn labrum. And they, they, they as I said to people, what will the orthopedic surgeon tell you is the solution to your problem? And the answer is surgery. But if you go to, uh, you know, if you go to someone else who's an expert in another field, they might say, well, you should do what my field is all about. You know, you don't need the surgery. So, and there's no one size fits all answer, but I say that to say that you can work around a lot of things, you know? So I decided I don't know if this was the best decision, but I ended up just not doing the surgery because I didn't want to have to be like, I don't know. It, a couple of people told me that like, you might never be back the same after the surgery, you know, and it doesn't always go perfectly. And the, the, the longer I live, not that I'm old, but the longer I live, the more I, I'm inclined to go as naturally as possible with any solution to a problem. And, and the less you know, medication you can take and the less like bandages you're wrapping around yourself. Like the more you're just kind of going pure, I, I feel like that's a healthier and more sustainable way to be because everything has a consequence, you know, like I know someone who got really sick because she took too many uh, painkillers. She was having too much ibuprofen or it's the equivalent. And it's, you know, so a lot of the time you're just masking a problem. So anyway, basically I would say get a good, uh, Get a good strength and conditioning program uh, before you get hurt, and then you'll be less likely to get hurt. Really quickly, though, I'll say this. So today I got hurt, and um, it was my Achilles. It was a weird kind of a thing where it was like a really basic thing that my body should have been able to do, but because I was ill-prepared, I didn't have the energy to like execute that movement. And the, the, I didn't have the strength in my foot at that particular moment to support my body weight. So my Achilles just like gave up for some, not for no reason. It's not like random, but the, 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 the thing that I identified today as a contributing factor was I hadn't eaten enough. And so I was kind of like, I was just a little tired and I was a little, I just felt weak on the court, especially as the session wore on. And I was actually thinking to myself five minutes before I got hurt, I was like, man, I, I really don't want to, I, I want to stop right now. Cause like I'm tired and I just don't feel good, you know? And, but that wasn't like, I wasn't unlucky today. I didn't prepare properly. And you know, your preparation, what is it? Well, it's your sleeping, your eating, and then your training. And, and if, if, if one thing is lacking, you're you're gonna be experiencing difficulty and 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 the more you play the more likely you are to, to get injured so you just have to a coach said it to me yesterday it's a it's a well-known line but he was kind of 
giving me some frank feedback and he said fail to prepare prepare to fail interesting um yeah i, I would like to also share, share some perspectives about that i mean i i, I i'm a player that I, I wouldn't say injuries have been a huge problem um you know when i've been playing um uh, however i don't think i've necessarily pushed myself to to an intensive level but um i have uh have some insights into that um i think good technique can help you avoid injuries when we talk specifically about tennis. So, um, you know, that's actually one thing, one big, big reason technique is important because it's not necessarily, can you hit the ball with a certain amount of effectiveness? It's like the strain that it puts on your body. So if you're like hitting the ball in a very inefficient way, it just puts so much strain and then sort of like that strain over time just sort of deteriorates your body. For instance, when I was, um, you know, when I hit, when I was having palm up, that what that did is it 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 wore down my um, elbow and it led to me having tennis elbow. So then, like, let's say I played over the course of a tournament, maybe I would have been playing a lot better toward in the finals or the, the later rounds, but my body had just been so beaten up. I just don't have much more to give. So that tech, having a good technical base can actually help you avoid injuries. Also, um, you know, as Fergus talked about, you want to make sure you're focusing on, you know, preventative medicine. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are talking about, like, you know, uh, just sort of masking the problem instead of preventing the problem from happening in the first place. And that could be because, you know, the doctor told you, you know, how not to get hurt or not to get sick or not how not to get injured in the first place or how are they going to make money. I don't know. I'm not trying to say there's a sinister idea behind it, but we don't focus on preventative medicine a lot. Like um, I read this book called TB12 and uh, it's by Tom Brady and um, you know how Tom Brady kept playing football in, in which is a very, you know, physically intensive sport where you can get injured really easily. How he kept playing, even though he was in his, um, you know, forties uh, was he focused a lot about um, stretching yoga, you know, um, doing exercises that, that uh, gave him flexible muscle, but also soft and pliable muscle. Like pliability is is the key word here. So it's not necessarily like this huge amount of muscle that you need, but it's sort of like having muscle, but making the muscle soft and pliable. For instance, like maybe if you can imagine this, let's say you have your chest, you know, let's say you take a take force to your chest, but you want your, your muscles to sort of kind of, you know, absorb it and send it out rather than just tear. But like lots of people just focus on this, this non-pliable muscle that gets very tight and then tears easily. People don't understand the importance of diet and how that work, that relates to, um, you know, m you know, avoiding injury. You know, you want to make sure you're drinking a lot of water and you want to make sure you're, you're, you're eating foods that, um, are anti-inflammatory. Um, so, um, yeah, so, yeah, I hope that can those insights can you know help everybody out there. Um, yeah, you've got a couple more questions. So, um, I you know Fergus, you were number one at Spring Hill College, uh, which I mean, um, a lot of people may not think is a big deal, but I mean, coming from you know a high school tennis player, um, you know, most high school players in the in the U.S. can't even get on a college tennis scene, even a relatively low college tennis team. So um, I thought that was pretty good, you know, your level. And um, I was also – and I was um, wondering if you could give some insights about, like, um, you know, what – how can uh, aspiring college tennis players uh, get to play college tennis, whether it be, you know, playing D2 or playing, um, you know, at some of the better colleges, like even like a University of Florida, University of Virginia – Mm. you know ohio state could you give some insights about that yes the first thing i'll say uh thank you for highlighting that about spring hill the one thing i share i share two things i share three things in common with uh nick balgieri one was that uh we both went to spring hill college mm -hmm. uh second one we both are tennis people obviously and the third one is that we both majored in philosophy mm. so Nick Baltieri apparently majored in philosophy at Spring Hill College. Um, rest in peace, Nick Baltieri. But uh, as far as college tennis players, I would say 
like everything, kind of like we're talking about the technique, like we're talking about with the injury, the earlier you can start working on something, the better. So I was saying in, in one of the breaks to Bryce, like if you're 16, you, you can't just wake up when you're 16 and say, oh, I want to play for Florida when you've never played tennis before. Like the the amount of time it's going to take you is just too much. So uh, the earlier you can start getting a lot of reps in, the better. Now, that's not to discourage someone who might be peaking later, you know, um, because one thing that I think people miss is there are so many levels of college tennis. And I think you'll be pretty aware of that, Bryce, but like there's junior colleges um, where they play loads and loads of matches. There's division three, there's division two and there's division one. And then also within division two and division one, division three, those divisions don't necessarily represent uh, like it's not actually a division in tennis where like the division one teams are always better than division two. They're like the, anyway, not to, you can maybe explain that if people want to know more about that, but like there are some division two teams that are better than division one. And, and mm-hmm. there are some division, three, some division three teams better than division one tennis teams. Um, so just to kind of, I, w- I would suggest people research it. One thing that I think makes it a lot easier for people now is to look at the UTR of a team and they can say, well, look, I'm a nine UTR and the Texas guys are all 12s and 13s. Okay. Well, I'm probably not going to play for Texas next year. But if you look at, you know, Birmingham Southern or Spring Hill uh, College. You look at the UTR, those guys, it's more like nines. There are some eights. There might be a couple of tens. But if you're a nine, you can kind of fit in on that team. And then so you just be you'd be smarter about your uh, the coaches that you're contacting if, if you are more familiar with the level of the team. So that would be something I would definitely suggest. Look at the levels of the teams that you're considering going to. And then you said it earlier, would ask. You just contact the coach and you say, you know, write a good email and you say who you are, what you're about, what are your interests, and I'd love to talk about your program, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I last thing I'll say I think is make sure you um make sure you meet the coach as much as you can and and like if you can visit the school do that and spend time with the players on the team. Sometimes the, the coach might give you an impression of a school, but it mightn't be the accurate impression. And then if you're to meet the players, a lot of the time they'll be pretty honest with you and say, look, this is how it is here. If you like it, you know, come along. And if, if you don't want that, I mean, it's better that you know that now before you, before coming here, you know? So try and talk to the players if you're curious. Mm-hmm. And the very last thing I'll say is if you can get someone just like the coaching, if you can get someone to help you with that process, who knows more about it than, than, you know, you'll be more efficient with your search, uh, for a college tennis program. So, mm. so the, the better a tennis you are, the, the better program you'll get to. Um, but, but also, yeah, ask, ask people for help and, and, um, just keep asking. Be persistent, like mm. everything. Mm. You know, um, you know, uh, yeah. Steve talks about this a little bit. Actually, Outliers is a book that I I got a lot of value from. And um, you know, some people can look at Outliers, uh, which is a book basically about like, you know, success is more so about nurture than rather than than nature, and it's not like necessarily the hardest worker is always the most successful person it's more like the environment you have so you know some people look at that in a nihilistic way but i actually look at it in a positive way for instance fergus talked about this earlier try to create a good environment for yourself to where you can develop as a tennis player like another guy that i interviewed you know um sebastian he went to a tennis academy that helped him grow and um you know ten thousand hours like you know, 10,000 hours is a lot, but, you know, over a long period of time, 10,000 hours is, might be two, three hours a day. And, you know, we all have uh, we all have an hour, two hours, maybe three hours per day to commit to something. So, you know, 
you know, just try to be consistent with the time that you're spending on practice. Um, you know, specific, I made a video about this earlier, but I actually got a uh, tennis scholarship um, at Spring Hill College uh, just simply by emailing the coach. And um, a lot of coaches are looking for players, especially sort of at the middle tier um, or even bottom tier levels. Um, they're looking for players to come that that can grow in it. And, and it's not necessarily – um, as exclusive as you may think, it is. A, it 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 can be difficult in any college tennis team, but many it's it's all situational. So, um, you know, send out emails, show your value, you know, um, you know, show how you can contribute to the team, and that can help you. I think get a, a college tennis scholarship. Also, One thing I'll say: mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know, especially in Ireland. I don't know if this is a problem in America, but when people say scholarship, sometimes that might only be very partial right so i don't want to i think it's important for you as well for, for anyone not to say like you can get a scholarship and that means you get a full ride or whatever i don't know if everyone knows that like um not all scholarships are equal so the more research you can do on a given you know you really need to just ask and say well exactly how much coach can you give me you know because they might say oh we can give you money but it might be a thousand dollars out of 30 right and and your yeah. parents still have to come up with 29 or whatever you know so yeah uh, with um with like be aware D2, of that yeah with d2 or d3 it's like a lot of it is sort of uh maybe like a little bit of scholarship plus other things or i think i don't know if d3 offers scholarships actually but for instance d2 is like maybe partial athletic scholarship or maybe you could get partial academic scholarship you yeah. want to definitely like be smart like with what your situation is like you don't want to go to a school that costs fifty thousand dollars and then you're getting like two thousand tennis scholarship but you know if you're if you play it right you can get i think in a lot of situations you can get the majority of the money off especially if you have you know a good good grades good act scores and whatnot so um yeah uh fergus we got about eight minutes um so uh I last question here. I would just like to um uh get some insights about how this whole journey through you know, starting tennis at four years old, um at the tennis academy, um and you know, playing coming all the way to the United States to play college tennis, I'm sure that's a huge transition, going to Lander and going to Spring Hill. Um, going to tennis Memphis, living in Memphis, going to California. I mean, this has been a very um, interesting journey in, in a lot of ways. And now you're all the way, you know, here. Um, I was just at, wondering if, you know, you could provide any insights about how this shaped you as a person or any lessons that you learned along the way. Yeah, it's, it's hard to summarize, but um, I'll say that tennis, again, to quote Steve Smith, uh, for the umpteenth time tonight, but tennis is a vehicle. He used to say that, or he does say that. And I've just been very fortunate to meet some wonderful people through tennis. And I don't know, that's not quite answering how it shaped me, but I would just say that's a, a privilege that I've uh, enjoyed uh, thanks to tennis. And um, it's it provided me with with a livelihood you know, I worked, I did three summers full time uh, in Connecticut and I did six months in Memphis and I did four months in California. And, and um, so it's, it's, you know, I, I'm very appreciative that like I have that as a way to, to make a living if I need it. And I can also do it in any number of places. So that that's just something I'm very grateful for. And, um, how has it shaped me? I, I think some of the ways are good and some of the ways are bad, you know, but, but, uh, I think it's, it's any sport is good for, for you to just get physically active and, and to be pursuing something, you know, it could be academics, it could be music, but if you're pursuing something and trying to improve, I think you'll improve as a person. Right. Uh, so I think that's a pretty universal thing you could say about tennis. That that's a positive thing. And, um, it also makes you, I think, pretty well able to adapt because you'll be traveling about around a bit and you'll have to react to situations in a match and you'll have to react to the weather and all sorts of um, unpredictable 
things, you know? So it does make you, I don't know if this is true, but you could say that it makes you resilient. The reason I'm hesitating to say that is, I mean, there's a lot of people who play tennis and you're like, she's like, I don't really want to be around that person, you know? <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of people who aren't very nice who seem to play tennis. <laughs> Especially, I don't know, when it gets pretty competitive, people can be pretty nasty. But, you know, one nice thing, I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this. I was playing a match the other night and it was it finished at like 1 a.m. <laughs> we went on at 10 p.m. I lost the match uh, 6-4 in the third and I was 3-1 up in the third set of that match and the guy was absolutely exhausted. He had played a doubles match in the morning. He had trained for a few hours and then he played a singles match in the evening and then he was playing against me. So he had, he had just played tennis all day and uh Three one down, he he missed a terrible shank, and he was like, "Oh, you know." But then, out of nowhere, he he just got this burst of energy, and he started getting really pumped up, and he started getting really loud after every single point, and even during the point, he was like grunting really loudly, and that really got in my head, like that really upset me. In at the moment, and I ended up going five three down, and I lost six four. And I was mentally weak in, in that set, for sure. And I was really annoyed with the guy because I thought he was being annoying. Now, that's that's my, you know, that's my problem. But after the match, as much as I, you know, as in scare quotes, I hated the guy in the, in the match. After the match, there was absolute respect for him. And I, I think that comes back to me as well. There was respect for your opponent after a fight. And that's, I think, a beautiful thing about tennis. You're in the thick of the battle, blowing, you know, toe to toe or whatever. And there might be real like arguments and there might be real bitterness. But then the match is over and you uh, you kind of appreciate each other and, and you respect each other. And that's a beautiful thing. And my coach said after the match, he was like, he didn't actually know because he hasn't seen me play that many matches. And I don't think he knows how anxious I get quite yet. He's learning how fragile I am mentally because I can look calm, but I'm, I'm actually not. And he said, uh, after the match, it's something every coach will tell you, but you're playing the ball. You know, you're not playing the opponent. You, you can't let that stuff affect you. But that's, that's some of the adversity that you'll come into. Like you'll have people um, maybe trying to upset your mental rhythm and, and you've, you've got to find ways to overcome that. And, and experience will teach you that more than anything. I think you just have to go out there and mess up and try to do it better the next time. Mm, yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for sharing those insights, uh, Fergus. Uh, all powerful stuff. Um, I, I especially like how, what you said about, uh, you know, um, building resiliency and um, also like uh, sort of the mutual bond and respect that you have for your competitor. So, um, yeah, as a, uh, you know, as far as um, how tennis helped me grow, um, I think tennis is what you go through. Tennis is a lot of what you go through in all the aspects of your life. For instance, like what you learn at tennis court can always be directly, um, you know, related to life. Like for instance, when you're when you're when you're up in a in a set, like um, it's a challenge of like not getting too ahead of yourself, and when you're down in a set, it's um, you know, about you know, kind of like not not being too negative and fighting back um you know when you lose a match it's about you know sort of acceptance and growing from that experience when you win a match it's about not um being complacent you know all those things are really powerful things for personal growth and that's a lot of the reason I coach um because you know a lot of the things that I do with juniors and you know what you can do um when you're working with the juniors really help them grow in a lot of ways so um yeah, so that's just kind of my views. Um, so uh, I think it's a good time to wrap it up. Um, Fergus, is there anything else you'd like to share? As, no, just we... on something you said, I like you saying, don't get too carried away with winning or losing. And I said to one woman today, she was asking about her son, and he, he was in a slump, she said. And um, I remembered that I, I was told this line by a coach, and it's written before you walk into Centre Court in Wimbledon but it applies exactly to what you just said. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. And that's mm. from the poem, if, 
uh, by Rudyard Kipling. So that's really what you're trying to get to is that state of peace with whatever outcome may happen and and just being present in that moment and doing everything that you can but without fear of losing and without pride excessive pride over winning hmm yeah yeah actually i um, i looked at uh novak djokovic i think maybe a year or two ago posted something about that uh like in the entrance of the of Wimbledon center court, like how where it says that. So I, I've actually seen that before. And, um, you know, I actually even kind of in some ways look at it like a spiritual journey, you know, like um, it's sort of like, you know, the love for the game, you know, what keeps you going, you know, why do you do it? Because it is a struggle, you know, it's sometimes it's just, it just, it's emotionally draining, physically draining, Sometimes you'll be up and then you don't even know how, how you, the hell you lost the match. It's just, it's all, it's all about that. But you know, that love keeps you, keeps you going. And um, also it just teaches you everything, you know, in general about life. And that's, that's why it's, I think it's so important. So uh, yeah. Um, well, um, yeah, I think this is a perfect stopping point for us. Um, thank you so much for joining us with me. I, and I, I think we had some really awesome insights. So, uh, you know, um, you know, we're going to cut it off right now. So this has been Bryce on the floor with another tennis improvement video here with uh, Fergus O'Rourke. Uh, um, thank you so much. Like, comment, subscribe. And as always, great luck out there in the tennis court, guys. Thanks, Bryce.